Well, thank you, Mary. Thank you, John. And let me add my welcome to, uh, to John's. It's really great to see you here in church this morning. And uh, keep your Bibles open, please, to Revelation chapter 20. We'll look at that in a minute. But I remember uh, about a year ago when Garrett and Katie first arrived here in the UK last September. They'd been here just one or two days from America. They were a little bit jet-lagged, and uh, we took them off to the autumn meeting of the Sussex Gospel Partnership. And I think it's fair to say they were blown away by what they saw. The partnership is a network of Bible-believing churches locally, and, uh, and, and you know, they, they are made up of churches like ours, independent churches, there's Reformed Baptist churches, there's uh, congregational churches, Anglican churches, but united in the scriptures and the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were more than just meeting together. We were worshipping together. We were making plans about training. We were speaking about church planting and sharing resources and so on. And it all culminated with a meal, with some table fellowship. So despite the significant doctrinal differences that were represented by all those churches and the very different ways of doing church, we were committed to unite together around the gospel for the sake of the kingdom. Unity is not the same as homogeneity. The goal of unity is unity in diversity, just as Garrett and Katie saw at that meeting. We can still have fellowship in the spirit despite significant disagreement because the love of God in Christ is so much bigger and better and the gospel needs so much more important. But that kind of thing doesn't happen overnight. It takes work. Unity is something we work at. It's a spiritual discipline for everyone. And focusing on the gospel and heaven and hell makes it a lot easier. So we've got to each work at unity, disciplining ourselves to see past differences to the gospel and the gospel need of our nation. And we have to commit to making that work. Disciplining ourselves each time, recognizing that, yes, I, I might not have this right every single time, and admitting that and being big enough to move on. And from my part, I need to commit to that too. And I need to model this for you. So I've appreciated the, the many bits of feedback I've had on the series of preaching in Revelation. And there's been lots of very positive stuff and there's been some critical stuff. And I expected that, of course. And I've loved the fact that, that most of you who have struggled have been so godly about it. Being open, being supportive, being committed to the gospel, committed to the church, yet voicing disagreement. And that's fine, that's good. From my part... I know I have to preach, and I have to preach with passion. Not to please man, but to please God. Not to scratch itchy ears, but to declare what I believe God says in his word. And at times I may have spoken harshly, or used a turn of phrase which with hindsight was spiky, for which I apologize if I have caused any upset. But unity in diversity, that, that goal of gospel partnership is something we're all going to work at and we've all got to be committed to it. So before we actually look at this text, which many of you will know has, has caused a little bit of a, a kerfuffle, to say the least, over the years, we're going to come and pray now. So let's pray. Will you pray with me? Our God and Master, we come to you through Jesus this morning not through a theological system, not through denominations or through our own power, but through Jesus Christ, our great high priest. Help us to keep this table that is below me as our goal, to love the body, to forgive and love as we in Christ have been so loved and forgiven. To have a posture, a demeanour uh, to our brothers and sisters which is consistent with our beloved gospel. Full of grace, full of love, ready to sacrifice, ready to serve. 
Because while we were enemies, Christ died for us. He didn't agree with us or our lives. Yet he loved us and moved towards us in bloody, passionate, sacrificial love. So give us his wisdom. Give us ears to hear that despite long-held, cherished views on this text, we might all learn something today and hear your voice. Even if our view does not change, that our heart towards those with a different perspective would grow all the more. And our commitment to unity in diversity remaining unshaken. Spirit of Jesus, we ask that you would bring great power now to our meeting, such that our fellowship at the table would amaze the world and even the angels themselves. For your glory and namesake, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, as we get started on this text, I want to use a a sprinkling of humour to get us in the right mood. Now, some of you will know that uh, Revelation 20 speaks of a millennium, a, a thousand years, and that there's been a lot of ink spilled over the years about how we're to take this, what's happening before, and so on. If we are among those who think that Jesus comes back before or prior to, pre the millennium, we may be described as pre-millennials. Or if we think that Jesus comes back after or post the millennium, we may be variously described as post-millennials or amillennials. But I want to suggest perhaps another more helpful position for us this morning as we begin. The pan-millennial position. It'll all pan out okay in the end. Yeah, there we go. Don't, don't give up your day job, Rich. Yeah. But, but that's it, though, isn't it, really? Actually, seriously, it will all pan out okay in the end if we're in Christ. We've got to hold on to that. We really have to. Now, again, whatever view we may take on this particular passage, one thing we should all agree on as we read it and, and, and look at what's written here is that it should excite us. It should make us really happy because it makes Satan really cross. And we love this chapter because of that. Satan hates this chapter of the Bible. And he wants us to squabble over it so that we miss the main point. And the main point, of course, is that it speaks of Satan's doom. Check it out in verse 10. There it is. And feel the earth shake. The devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That is the big thing going on in Revelation chapter 20. God dealing with evil Revelation 20, if nothing else, makes this clear statement of who is in charge, who wins. Its main theme then is the supremacy of God in Christ and this ultimate wonderful victory over evil. Whether it is people who oppose Jesus, whether it is systems, forces of evil, ideologies, armies, spiritual powers, whoever, whether they're long dead or whether they're still alive this morning, All evil will be thrown into the lake of fire. And that includes death itself. Verse 14. The living God, the living God is preparing the whole cosmos for a future without the stain of death and sin anymore. That's, That's the big thing here. So, let us look through verses 1 to 10 and we'll check out various views. But as we do that, I kind of want us to be kind of fist pumping our way through it, okay? Well, mentally at least, because it would be quite distracting if we were all actually doing that. Jesus wins. Satan is the loser. God has got this. That's what we're thinking. That's what we're holding on to here. So verses 1 to 3, first up. What's going on here? Well, clearly Satan is bound for a thousand years. His power to deceive the nations is ended and he's released at the end for a short period of time. That's what it says. There's no question over the power of the jailer, is there? 
No question over who is in charge of detention and release. Again, the big picture. God has got this. And then verses 4 to 6, we see the faithful departed, the dead in Christ, described here in verse 4 as those who had not worshipped the beast or got its mark, together with the martyrs, and they are reigning with Christ for this thousand-year period. Again, big picture. This is awesome, isn't it? This is enough to get even the faintest heart beating. On our holidays... A couple of weeks ago we visited Oxford and uh, I wanted to take the kids in particular to the, the Martyr's Cross on the end of Broad Street where Latimer and Ridley and Cranmer were burned alive for this faith that we hold on to. And you can still see the scorch marks on the doors of Balliol College from the fire. It's still there. As we see that we remember really this tells us the ultimate victory. Queen Mary did not win that day. That's why Latimer could bravely say to, the, to his, his friend Mr Ridley, he said, be of good comfort Mr Ridley, as the flames were burning him alive. Be of good comfort Mr Ridley and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England that I trust shall never be put out think of them the martyrs or think of our brothers and sisters more recently who have died at the hands of ISIS or other nations the so called victory of jihadi johns or queen mary no this is victory we've got the real story right here and closer to home we can think of our brothers and sisters, many of them this year, who have recently gone from us. The dead in Christ. My friends, this passage is teaching us that the evil of death and persecution and its pretend victory. Well, we know that it's not the end. We know that it's not the real victory. We know ultimately who has got this. It is our God he is in charge. And hold on to that, my friends, as a comfort. Now, the debate and the questions arise when we start to get a little bit closer to the text. And we ask, when? When is this thousand years? And of course, good and honorable scholars and pastors and, of course, church members over long, long periods of time have debated this. Does Christ return before or at the end of, after the millennium? And there are four main camps, four groups, four views. So, put your seatbelts on and take a mental swig of strong coffee and let's get going. Now, there are those who think that Jesus comes back before the millennium, pre the millennium, and because everyone loves being labelled, they get lumped with the label pre-millennials. Jesus comes back before, and there are two main groups of pre-millennials. There are historic pre-millennials, and there are dispensational pre-millennials. And both schools are actually very different, even though they both agree that Jesus returns before the millennium. So that's the first two of our four groups. And obviously, in contrast to them, there are those who think that Jesus returns at the end of the millennium, after the thousand years, and naturally they get lumped with the label post-millennial. And again, within that, there are two main groups. There are the classic post-millennials, and then a, a subset of post-millennials who are unfortunately called a-millennials. A-millennial meaning without millennium. But that's not what they actually believe. They believe that there is a millennium. They just don't think that it's literally a thousand years. It's a symbolic period of time. So there are your four main groups, okay? And as far as I know, as far as I know, I think all four are here in church this morning. <laughs> Praise the Lord for that. It doesn't make my job any easier. But this is what we're thinking about. Unity in diversity. That's awesome. Remember the goal. It's that table 
despite our differences. So the big question comes then, as, uh, why, why? Why do these groups all disagree? Why do two of them think that Jesus returns first uh, and then the millennium? And why do the other two think that, that he returns at the, 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 the end of the millennium, whether it's literally a thousand years or not? Well, the main reason that people disagree is based on whether or not we think that the events of chapter 20 are following hot on the heels of chapter 19, i.e. we're reading chronologically. If we are to read it chronologically, if 20 does follow in time on from 19, then yes, clearly Christ returns before the millennium. There he is at the end of chapter 19, returning on his white charger, coming in judgment. It's very hard to dispute that if you've already committed to a chronological reading. Now, in the West... That's the way we're used to looking at texts. That's the way, the way we're used to thinking of history. A sequence of events, one after the other. And so, for many of us, it's more natural to read accounts like this as chronological. And that is the great strength and appeal of the premillennial position. Chronology feels comfortable. We're at home with it. Furthermore, the dispensational form of premillennialism, which arose in the mid-19th century, was partly a response to the, the liberalising of colleges and seminaries. And at the time, there was rightly a great fear of spiritualising away everything of value in the Bible, as liberal theology tends to do. And so the dispensationalist response was to say that they alone were now taking the scriptures literally and seriously. And again, you can see the, the appeal and the heart behind that, can't you? Who doesn't want to take scripture seriously and literally? And, and so there came out of the dispensational premillennial camp a redoubled effort to read Revelation chronologically, but now with this extremely cautious approach to identifying anything in these visions as symbolic. So around the 20th century, turn of the 20th century, you've got guys like Schofield and Darby putting together a whole new system of reading scripture, and in many ways it is quite brilliant. But it is very different. So those pre-millennials who couldn't accept that system now styled themselves as the historic pre-millennials in order to basically say, well, we were here first and we're not the same, just a different group of pre-millennials. So that's the pre-millennial groups. But Christianity is not a Western religion. And so many people don't assume chronology and that they feel very comfortable with parallel pictures. And so if we don't read chapters 19 and 20 chronologically, we can say that the events here are capturing the same thing but looking from a different perspective, a different camera angle. So Christ can return at the end or after, post the millennium because there's a judgment at the end of it if we read in verses 7 to 15 of chapter 20. And so they argue it is the same judgment as has already been seen in chapter 19 and in chapter 16 and so on. You're seeing it from a different camera angle. And so the decision for post-millennials is whether or not the enumeration of a thousand years is literally referring to a thousand earth orbits of the sun. Or whether, like other enumerations in apocalyptic literature, we take it as a symbol of something else, a symbolic period of time, 10 times 10 times 10, a period of perfection in terms of its length of time. Now, there are obviously implications for that, but generally speaking, that, that is the only difference between post- and a-mill Christians. And with, I guess, the exception of the newer dispensational premillennialism, the, the other three camps can trace their view back through a long way of history, and they can raise up their, their champions and say, well, look, Spurgeon and Luther and Calvin and John Owen, and, and you can have your heroes. But again, that's not really helping us, is it? Also, we must be careful not to automatically associate one particular millennial viewpoint with 
other views. For example, it's, it's quite common, and I hear this often, it's quite common to hear that people saying, if, if you are post-mill or a-mill, you must therefore be into replacement theology. But that's simply not true. Actually, all four camps have an association of some point, adherence to, to some kind of replacement within them. So let's not associate that error with one particular millennial view. So, with all that said, I've got to land this, haven't I, at some point. And I know that some of you won't agree with how I take it, and that's fine, honestly, it is. I'm really not interested in changing your mind, that's up to the Spirit of God. But I have to tell you how I think it works and why. And we can't not think about this. It would be naughty to miss this chapter out, and silly. This is in the Bible. We are warned not to take anything away from this prophecy. There is blessing for us here. And if nothing else, it provides an opportunity for us to to work at that discipline of being united despite our differences, doesn't it? If If nothing else, it gives us that. Now, each of those four main views has its challenges. None of them are straightforward. They all have questions that arise and leave our heads burning sometimes. All of us have questions to answer. My view, I know, it has questions. And so does yours. And we've all got to accept that. So, how do we proceed? Well, firstly, with caution. And I should have asked Pedro for his tin hat that he uses. Well, we we proceed with grace. We proceed with respect with a commitment to to unity despite differences. And with that kind of fist-pumping, yes, God has got this. Satan is getting crushed at the end. That's the main point here. We, We agree on that. We rejoice with it. Secondly, I'd suggest we proceed with a commitment to the analogy of faith, that Scripture interprets Scripture, that the clearer passages give us the the, the light on the the less clear passages. It's not the other way around. And that we do and should take Scripture seriously and literally and theologically, but letting context and genre and content shape what that means. Because not all Scripture is the same. Wisdom literature is not the same as epistle, and history is not the same as apocalyptic, and so on and so forth. Literalism must be literary. Did I get that right? Yeah. Literalism must be literary. For example, when Jesus says, I am the gate of the sheep, we know what he means. It's a figure of speech, a turn of phrase. He's not saying, I am literally a gate through which sheep pass. And when uh, we read in in Revelation that he's a lion or we read elsewhere, we don't, no, he's the God man. He's not actually a lion, a figure of speech. Peter, when Jesus says, upon this rock, he's not, you know, the church isn't literally built on Peter. That's not how communication works. And that is all the more important when we respect the genre of apocalyptic literature. Everybody. Every, all four of those groups have to, at some point, interpret Scripture according to its genre, context, and content. And recognize, yes, there are spiritual meanings, there are turns of phrase, there are allegories that are in play in Scripture. There are symbols, and there are figures of speech. So I'm, I'm personally really happy not to assume a chronology here. I think we've already made that clear that we are taking a parallelist view of recapitulation and there are good reasons for that at the end of chapter 11 for example heaven proclaims that the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our lord and of his christ and he shall reign forever and you know the one famous by handel well it's in the bible first but, you know, we know it from that, that the kingdom of God and of his Christ, yes, and he's taken power and he's begun to reign, it says. He has judged the nations and the people, small and great. That's an interesting phrase. 
It's, it's tough to reconcile that, I think, with a chronological reading. And then in chapter 14, again, we, we see the redeemed who follow the Lamb are called the first fruits of God. We read that Babylon has fallen, the wrath and judgment of the Lamb, and the Son of Man coming with the clouds. We, we read that in 14. In chapter 16, it speaks of the great battle of Armageddon, which in chapter 16 itself, it links by, in verse 19 to the fall of Babylon, which is then narrated to us in chapter 17 and 18 by way of replay. The text itself is suggesting that it's the same battle, not a different one. And then at the end of chapter 19, we have another vision of Jesus returning and judging the nations. And that judgment has the same kind of language and pictures as the battle of Armageddon. And it's also what, very similar to what we see from verse 11 of chapter 20 here. The language and picture and phrases are very similar. So I believe it to be one and the same battle. Furthermore, I believe that there's a strong parallel here in chapter 20 with what you read in chapter 12, verses 7 to 17. Both chapters picture a battle with Satan. Satan being cast down and involved in some deceiving, but full of rage because his time is short. That his fall results in the kingdom of Christ and of his saints. And that the rule and kingship of the saints is not only based on Satan's fall, but on their testimony to Jesus and their faithfulness to him. In my mind, a chronological reading raises too many questions about how there can be so many returns of Jesus and so many final judgments. I, I, what's going on? So I suppose I must be in one of those two post-millennial camps. However, my main reason for not being a pre-millennial believer is actually found right here in chapter 20 itself. Now, the pre-millennial position states that Christ's rule for this thousand-year period, it, it, that, that Christ returns and then rules for a thousand years, and that with him, the martyrs and the dead in Christ, that they're raised up, they receive their resurrection bodies. And I, and I can see why, uh, by the thinking of premillennialism, why you'd say that from chapter 20. It makes sense of a basic reading, if you've already assumed that chronology. Sure. But I do think there are a couple of issues there. Firstly, the millennial rule of Christ, according to premillennials, it's supposed to speak of this universal, idealistic, kind of triumphant golden age of world peace. But I don't see world peace described here in chapter 20. But, I'll, you know, can let that one slide. More worryingly, I think, is this question of how can the Son of Man, who has already, according to premillennials in chapter 19, judged the nations so comprehensively with the sword that comes from his mouth and the gorging of the flesh of the unbelievers by the birds of the sky. If that has happened, who are the nations here from the four corners of the earth in verse 8 that are so numerous they cannot be numbered? Where did they come from? Ah, through the millennial reign of, you know, they're the, they're the ones who've lived through the millennium. I hear the answer in my head that they've been deceived by Satan when he's released. At the end, there's a great apostasy. So through the millennial reign of Jesus, where there's supposed to be global peace, no opposition to Christ, because they've all been eaten by the birds, only the faithful in the garden of God but they get turned by Satan again. That apostasy sounds like another fall. That's a big problem, I think, for premillennialism. Another option, perhaps, in answer to that is that somehow not all of the unbelievers were actually judged at the return of Christ in chapter 19. That, uh, you know, it, it implies they were, yes, but maybe not all of them were. And depending on whether you're a historic or a dispensational premillennialist, you might say that it could be the Jewish people, it could be some Gentiles who didn't get judged. But again, logically, that answer, we have unbelievers living during the millennial reign of Christ. And I have to ask, why? And how can we have the martyrs and 
the, the dead in Christ with unkillable, unaging resurrection bodies living on the earth alongside unregenerate unbelievers who are allowed to repopulate the earth such that they can't be numbered and Satan can turn them again. I, I don't see how that fits with the rest of scripture in terms of the resurrection. That resurrection future, our resurrection future might be lived in the presence of unbelief, even if only for a thousand years. That's a big question for me. So I take it that the rest of this chapter, uh, the repeat of, this is a repeat of chapter 19 and chapter 12 and chapter 16 and so on. That, that, that it's the same final scene shown from a different angle. And on this case, in this occasion, it is the focus of the judgment of Satan. And I'm showing you my hand now completely. I am a millennial. So I think that Jesus returns at the end of the millennium, but that the millennium doesn't have to be a thousand orbits of the sun. Yes, I think we are in the millennium now. I think Christ is reigning from heaven. I think that the kingdom of Christ is advancing through the work and the mission of the church around the world and that at his sudden and glorious appearance at the end of the age, all of the battles and judgments will take place on that great and final day. I believe the enumeration follows the same pattern that we've seen already in Revelation and apocalyptic literature, that numbers symbolize greater realities. And no, that doesn't mean that you can assume that the six days of creation could be six billion years. Because that's not to respect the genre of scripture. Genesis isn't apocalyptic. Actually, it's the enumerations of the Old Testament that give the meanings to these apocalyptic numbers. So I am a proud young earth six-day creationist. But anyone who's been around the block who doesn't agree with my position, might be wondering how I deal with the great weakness of amillennialism, which is to do with the binding of Satan. What does that actually mean? How can Jesus... What does this reign of Christ actually mean? He, Satan doesn't look that bound. As I said, every position has questions to answer. And it's a very good question. And I ain't got all day to answer it. And, you know, nothing I've said this morning is covering everything. I know that. There's a lot more to say. But I do believe the answer is found as we work our way through the rest of Scripture, other New Testament passages. What does it mean that Satan is bound? And what does the kingdom of Christ on earth look like? What does the rest of the Bible tell us about that? Well, a couple of examples for us. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 15 uh, 14 and 15. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. That's on page 1002, if you're looking these up. Hebrews 2, 14. Speaking of Jesus, it says, He shared in our humanity that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. So that passage, it clearly says that at the death of Christ, the devil was destroyed. There's questions. Page 1022, 1 John 3, verse 8, second half of the verse. 1 John 3, verse 8, simply says the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. So his works are destroyed too. Colossians 2, verse 15, page 984. Colossians 2, 15 says that Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. And that's referring in verse 14 to the cross. So just a few verses there by way of survey, that speak of the devil being destroyed, disarmed, being put to open shame, and the triumph of Christ. That's what the death of Christ did to the opposition. So if we have a big question over the language of binding and what does that mean in Revelation 20, I think we need to recognize that it exists in these other passages too and deal with that. 
Well, what about the reign of Christ? What about the reign of Christians? Well, elsewhere in the New Testament, we read of Christians being raised up and seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. Ephesians 2 verse 6, that we have every spiritual blessing in Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 3. Again, in Colossians 2, if you've still got that open in front of you, you can read that we've been given the fullness in Christ and that Christ is head over every power and authority. That's the language of rule. So perhaps the binding of Satan... And the kingdom of Christ on earth doesn't demand that there is universal peace, an earthly golden age. I don't believe Revelation 20 demands that, or these other passages. But respectfully, I'm sure others would disagree. After Jesus' resurrection in Matthew 28, Christ said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He rules. Philippians 2 Because of the cross, Christ has been given this name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus and so on. Matthew 12 is an interesting one. Matthew 12. Jesus says in Matthew 12 that the kingdom has come and it is in your hearts and that the strong man is bound that we may plunder his house. Christ will build his church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against us. My view is that Satan's binding is just like that. That he cannot stop the global spread of the gospel. Going round the nations, through the nations, with the church and its great commission. Bringing the kingdom of God in people's hearts as they come to faith in Christ. As we proclaim Jesus as Lord, there is nothing Satan can do to stop that. And there are Christians in China. And there are Christians in North Korea. Praise the Lord. The martyrs and other faithful departed are in heaven with Jesus. More alive now than ever. Reigning with him. I don't think they've received their resurrection bodies yet. I don't think that's what Revelation 20 verse 4, the end of that verse, is saying. Actually, if you read it in the Greek, the the idea that they came to life is just not there. It should simply read, they lived and reigned with Christ, as we have in the authorised version, rather than they came to life. It's just not there in the Greek. So they lived and they reigned with Christ, and I believe that is consistent with Jesus' teaching in John chapter 5. If you want to look this up, it's on page 890. Because again, there's a question, what does this resurrection mean? Well, Jesus says in John 5 from verse 25, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Jesus says here and in John 11 that there is a resurrection to life which refers to faith. When we come and we hear his voice we transfer from death to life. Those who believe me will live even though they die. John eleven twenty five, But crucially also, Jesus says here that there is a real physical resurrection to come to. The hour is coming, Jesus says, when even those who are in their tombs will hear his voice and come out. A great future day of physical resurrection. This is what I think is being said in verses 4 and 5 of Revelation 20. The dead in Christ The martyrs living and reigning with Jesus now in this millennial period. The first resurrection. Like Jesus himself, they tasted a first death. And right now they await their physical resurrection. But they will not face a second death. 
On that great and final day, Jesus will come in power and will speak and all the dead in their tombs or in the sea. Or, you know, verses 11 to 15, all death and Hades are going to give up their dead and everyone, both great and small, there's that phrase again, will stand before the throne of Jesus. The second death will not harm those whose name are in the book of life. This is good news. Whether they've tasted death and been with Jesus in heaven waiting for resurrection morning or are alive when he suddenly returns. Everyone who, will, who trusts in Christ, whose name is in the book of life, will have that future and never taste a second death. But everyone will be raised whether they believe in Jesus or not. Those named in the book of life will be raised up to a resurrection of life, John 5, 29. And those whose names are not will be raised up to a resurrection of judgment. The unbelievers will be physically raised, resurrection bodies, but in order that they would be consciously tormented in the everlasting fires of the second death with Satan, with the beast and the false prophet. Now, I wish we had longer. I really do, to spend more time on this, but we don't. And I hope that you feel I've tried to fairly engage with different views and answer some questions, but also preach what I believe, which I must do. And you don't have to agree and perhaps, let me give an example of one dear member who said to me after another recent sermon, Rich, I didn't really agree, but I really enjoyed coming to understand a different perspective. I learned something. Could that be you this morning? Whatever position we may hold on this text, we unite and make an effort to unite in the gospel that saves us. My view or your view is not the thing that saves you. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that saves you. My view, your view should not be a bar to our fellowship at this table. It does not create any conditions to be out of fellowship unless we let it through the lies of Satan and a bitter root. So let us unite together in the really basic and joyous truths of Revelation chapter 20. This is where the blessing is found for us. This is what Satan goes mad over. And we shouldn't spend too much time squabbling and missing this point. Satan and all evil is coming to an end, friends. Death is coming to an end. The things that torment us day and night in our bodies, in our minds, in our emotions... God, at the last, will drive them all away, all your fears, all your enemies, put to one side. And you will live and reign with Christ on a renewed earth, in a resurrection body that cannot ever die and be touched. And God himself will wipe away every tear. All your fears gone. What a future we have, friends. What a future. And as we live in the light of that, we can rejoice. Rejoice as a body together. And we're going to do that now as we sing. Yes, finished. The Messiah dies. The hymn says, The reign of sin and death is over, and all may live from sin set free. Satan and his pretended throne swallowed up in victory. Death, hell, and sin now subdued. All grace is now to sinners given. So I plead this atoning blood and claim the title deeds of heaven. And I may add Mr. Wesley also of earth.